for the faculty and teacher struggles um, panel. This is a discussion that we wanted to have about, um, we wanted to make sure that we invited uh, faculty and teachers to discuss with us at this Rocky Mountain Student Power Convergence today because uh, we know that students need much more of their own power um, and much more input in that decision making processes that affect us. Um, and to, to democratize our campuses would really be a wonderful way to do that. But we also um, need to acknowledge up front um, as students that anything that we do will only be more powerful uh, and more effective if we also are partnering with our teachers and our faculty um, at our universities and our schools. Um, number one, just for building our own power, uh, they can help us build that as allies. Uh, but the other part is that um, faculty and teachers themselves have serious issues right now um, and they are experiencing a lot of changes in their profession um, with the changes that are coming through education privatization, um, with a lot of the dynamics that uh, are going, are animating our, uh, our education system right now. Um, and we wanted to create space um, for teachers and faculty to both share uh, their experiences and uh, to help the students better understand, the students here uh, better understand what's going on on the other side of the classroom, um, but then to also have a discussion about how can we collaborate? What is the way in which um, our struggles being aligned as they are can support each other? Um, because we know that there is going to be a sort of Venn diagram dynamic where there are go there's going to be overlap in what faculty need accomplished and what uh, students need accomplished, um, but that there also will be some separate things that we need to be doing um, on our own and for ourselves. Uh, so we have with us today three teachers um, who are of the highest quality, um, and um, we're going to we're going to it's true it's true, uh, and we're going to let them just go ahead and just introduce themselves. Um, and uh, did you gentlemen already talk about like kind of structure? Do we just want to like have y'all talk for like five to ten minutes each about? The biggest issues and then go to discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't really talk. We just started talking about it, and I don't even know who the other panel is. Ah, so oh, the other one is Chris. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so this is good. Oh, great. Right. Yeah, who was also an instructor panel just for right, beforehand. Right. So, um, so yeah, uh, do you want to just introduce yourselves, and then and then we can also just go around the room and briefly introduce ourselves as well. Um, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, Jennifer Hall, Chief Teacher Education Officer at you want to start, Alan, or we'll just go on? Okay, I'm Alan Gilbert. Um, actually, I think this is in some distance. Yeah, absolutely. We, want to, we definitely want you to show. Um, so I was uh, in SDS for a long time in Harvard, and uh, one of the leaders of the Harvard strike plan was expelled from Harvard because of the advanced graduate student and really did it by majority voting faculty. And although I was her fight at the time, I was also a fight with my fight on something that I didn't know. So uh, anyway, and um, so I thought some about the energy of student movements and the link with faculty organizing. I now teach at the School of International Studies at the University of Canada. And uh, unfortunately, it's a private university that has one of the private university teams that they have uh, rules against faculty organizing. So the, the American Association of University Professors, but not the American Federation of Teachers, which I joined when I school of teaching at this Um, I'm Chad Halker, I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at UC Denver. I direct a social justice minor. Um, I'm also on the education committee of Occupy Denver and organize teachings and alternatives to institutional education. Um, I'm just going to say a bit about what I was going to talk about, just if you have an idea. <laughs> this will be our kind of open conversation. So I just want to talk about three things uh, today. The first, I want to talk about what it is that faculty and students would share what, what binds them politically, and that's going to be financialization and debt um, and organization of the university. And the second thing I want to talk about is um, perhaps some of the assumptions that students have about faculty um, and, and probably false ones about the political engagement and practical knowledge that faculty may or may not have. 
um, because that should influence student organizing, or inform it at least. And the third thing I want to talk about is, and this is very brief, all this is very brief, is imagination, the kind of social imaginary around education itself. Um, we'll be talking about student movements and talking about organizing around an institution like a, a university or a college versus other forms of education outside of that institution um, which have different purposes and, and ends. So, here. Those are the three. Great. My name is uh, Chris Tesla. I am a French teacher at Cherokee Trail High School for Cherokee School District. Um, I've been in Cherokee School District for six years. At uh, University of Connecticut, I taught undergraduate French for two years there as well. Uh, I've been involved with the Irish and the French uh, school systems um, by comparison. Uh, I hope to bring a global perspective, but also a K-12 perspective to, uh, to the conversation. So today what I sort of wanted to talk about was race to the top policy, Senate Bill 191, and how that's sort of a catalyst uh, toward the corporatization, uh, of the corporatization of public education. Um, so I think that we, uh, be the best way to do this will just be to have um, the three of you give your, your you know, make, have some opening comments just about um, the, the parts that you said that you wanted to mention. Um, and but before we do that, then we just go around and just uh, introduce ourselves and you know whatever's relevant that you want to say about yourself. I don't have any sort of structure um, as long as we can do the so we can uh, get to the real meat of the discussion. So um, can we just start. Uh, I'm Simon Mustafa, I'm a PhD student at CU Boulder. I'm currently mainly involved with the uh, CU Boulder Diversity Campaign. Jason Mayer, I'm an undergrad student at the University of College in Washington. Uh, my name is Zachary, I'm here as a delegate officially for the RSC, which is an anti capitalist organization, student organization in Utah. Um, in Utah. <laughs> of all places, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite the challenge. I'm Elena Wilson, I'm a graduate student at the University of Colorado Boulder, also involved with fossil fuel divestment. And I'm Kate, I'm a grad student at Naropa, and I'm also involved in the divestment campaign, um, fossil fuels. I'm Miller, I'm with the Arts Society, and I'm interested in arts education. I'm Greg Simpson. I'm an adjunct in our history at Metro State here on this campus. And um, I've done, when I was a grad student, I did student organizing against tuition hikes and budget cuts, and uh, also worked with Occupy Wall Street um, in various capacities, including Labor Outreach Committee, and I'm currently working with the Metro State Affiliate Faculty Association which is sort of a new group that's trying to, actually doesn't really quite have an organizing model for adjuncts, it's, it's kind of a hybrid between an activist group and a, like a professional organization that's trying to pull in the direction of activism. <laughs> well, definitely adjuncts are important to some people. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in the discussion. Yeah, get the discussion. Uh, my name is Rashawn, um, I'm one of the organizers of Drug Out Student Power Curtains, and I am a DU Master Student Dropout. I'm Kate, I go to Regis University, and uh, I come from a long line of teachers and professors. I'm Christine, I'm a student there at Metro State. I am a staff member with the Institute for Women's Studies and Services, and I sit as treasurer for the Metro State Family Staff. My name is Sarah, I'm the University of Denver Law School. I'm one of the organizers. <laughs> I'm really, I'm a high school student in Aurora. I'm Ian, I'm another student at the new uh, grad student. Hi, my name is Ben Tran, and I'm a community college student in Los Angeles. I was a brief intern for the AFT local grad school. And I'm part of the California Student Union. <laughs>
it'll be through an order, I guess. I don't know where to start. Should we start with some of the history of, of faculty struggling, kind of contextualizing, and whatever, whatever you want to add. Five, five, ten minutes. Um, the first thing I want to say, actually, fits a little bit. That's what the imaginary um, You had a really good discussion of the rules of this meeting and trying to encourage the participation of everyone. And I think the meeting point that faculty need change in life is to have classrooms which are student oriented in the sense that they're about people finding something that can be on fire. And they're about involving everyone in participating. And I listen to you and I learn something. And I try to do that in classrooms and children go to the open school in the desert, which is one of those places. But I would just say that it's a mistake, it would be a mistake for us to have this be simply a conversation about economic issues. And this week I'm still teaching two seminars at DU, and I'm also teaching a course at Micro. So, what do you want to discuss these things? So, that's just part of it. Um, when I was in the student, most of the faculty had been purged by the Cold War and were silenced by the Cold War. And there were very few who had the courage to stand up. There were many against the war in Vietnam. The fact is, there were very few who came up for student demonstrations. And we had a movement which lasted many years. And often we had groups, we would call meetings, and we would have groups that would be much smaller than this one, and not with energized activists. And so one of the things you have to learn early on if you're going to survive, because a lot of people didn't, is not to get too high when you call for a rally and then attack Cambodia and 5,000 people came out of the house and stupid organizers were there. You see a way of finding the show out you see a <laughs> um, but most of the time we had, we had meetings of nine people and we had rallies of 20 people and they were all very good causes and we all learned a lot but it wasn't like you try to do this and suddenly everything comes out it's not like Arab Spring all the time it's not <laughs> like Occupy Wall Street and Zuccotti Park all the time a lot of times it's just working through and so the first thing I'd like to say about the student movement is, I'll just describe my history. I was a grad, I was, well actually I was involved as an undergraduate at Harvard in the first anti-Vietnam war movement, which is called the May 2nd movement. And because I was an undergraduate, I had a lot of footstep. Um, all of the graduate students and the other faculty of whom were quite a number of them had a chance to debate and George Bundy elected me to do it. They said, Alan, you do it. And so fortunately, this really smart graduate student, supposed to be helping me prepare a question, which was, how do you expect to win a war against the victorious peasant revolution by fighting to restore the landlords? <laughs> and Bundy yes. didn't do too well on the whole audience of St. Peter's Theater and Cheers, and it was all very nice. Um, but anyway, I went away for a year because it looked to me like we would take a revolution to change things in America, and I didn't know that's what was possible. So I studied up on the labor movement, and I came back here as a graduate student. And I was the 500th person at Dow City, chemical city, city in Dow, made home for the past nine years something made so And then we were all put on suspension. And then I was one of 300 students who sat in upstairs in Payne Hall to listen to the faculty debate ROTC. And we were a whack in the Payne Hall, maybe it was the Payne Hall, but maybe it was the Payne Hall, P-A-I-N-A, I don't know. But, um, so it was easy to throw me out um, this in the takeover of the building. But what I want to say about it is, most of the time, organization is fairly solitary and we didn't think about organizing nonviolently. We didn't know that at the time. Even though Martin Luther King was very much active at the time. So most of what we did was nonviolent, for which we were fairly fiercely hounded by Harvard. 
uh, which was a very nasty place, particularly in the administration at the time. My dear say that it will outdo the nastiness any administration that anyone is familiar with, although probably you can persuade me to put them in the At least it has, it's, it's a good benchmark. Um, about faculty, there were heroic faculty, and two of them were Jack Stadler and Mike Schwartz, who were beginning teachers. And um, both of them ended up having to go elsewhere very quickly. And they organized a large course called Social Relations 148 with about 600 students, and they were broken down into sections of 15 students, and I eliminated Sue Nine and Red Rover, and had a good time, and we all had a lot of experience. And this is the better part of student faculty organizing where you can do things together and to do things that have significant educational purposes and be discussed. So we had the Harvard strike, we shut Harvard down, we were attacked ferociously you know, by the police in Cambridge. Um, and um, quite a number of us were thrown out of school for putting the board of entry. And the movement was a great experience because it taught most of us to become faculty members and who wanted to do something. And several of us did. And Mike Schwartz was organizing this course on I go speaking at a school in Stonebrook, a book I wrote now. <laughs> again, we just connected again. Um, but most of the faculty, most of the young faculty did the following thing. They wanted to get tenure, and if they succeeded at getting tenure, by keeping their mouths shut for seven years, they had a startling experience when they opened their mouths again. What they wanted to say was different. <coughs> they weren't the same people. That is, it is true that um, being a global activist is like exercise. Mm -hmm. Muscles which are disused vanish. And you, you know, just take steps along the road is the hardest. So there seems, anyway, I would just say about this, um, there was a nonviolent sit-in at Harvard in support of a living wage for campus workers. Those campus workers were making 1075 hours, so they had to sleep in their cars. And it was a nonviolent sit-in, and Harvard freaked out, but actually it was a coordination of the um, I think that there are a lot of possibilities if one learns that really, you know, well, there are no, everybody doesn't get to be Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King barely got to be Martin Luther King. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no, I mean, if you read about his life from the inside, and I know some people who knew him. Um, very complicated. And a lot of other people could have been Martin Luther King, but met up with Martin Luther King, and they were amazing. I think that's important. But the truth is, you don't have to be amazing to accomplish that. And probably that's the main thing about this. You don't have to be some special faculty member. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have books published in famous places. You don't have to have $2 million of debt. All of these things. Being at a community college, um, as I heard you speak at the organizers meeting the other day, or being in high school. You know, the fact is that you may accomplish a great deal that none of us will correct you. And I would just say, you know, I'm really thrilled to be here. It's you know, a pleasure to discuss these things. I know you have pretty well from Occupy, and so uh, particularly pleasure to turn to Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> What's that? I was just waiting for the good. There's a the boss there. We don't need to applaud because we have the, the thanks is understood, and we want to continue like to leave the things. Um, it's funny that Alan was talking about Mike Schwartz, who I actually brought up here to Stony Brook a couple years ago, because he's at Stony Brook now, he got fired, he retired at Stony Brook, and that's where I did my PhD, and was a student organizer, and so I went. I, I moved to New York just a few weeks before 9-11, so when 9-11 happened, there was no political organization on campus, so I started one, and then I went through and I researched all the faculty to try to find people that I might be able to organize with. And there was Mike Schwartz, right? and he was great. And um, actually, the the trip that he made to Denver was to um, uh, give a talk about his book that he wrote on the Iraq War. Um, and we did a lot of anti-war organizing. Um, myself as a graduate student and him as a faculty member at Stony Brook. Um, so the histories uh, cross. Um, 
I just want to talk about those three things that I mentioned, um, and I'm talking about the contemporary now, um, which is there's a process happening right now in higher education that is um, bringing a convergence of interest between faculty and students. I mean, there are there are many things like war, um, uh, environmental issues, divestment issues. I mean, faculty have interest in those, um, but the entire structure of the university system. Um, is changing, and it's changing through this process of um, withdrawing of public funding, privatization, and financialization through the student loan process. I know some of you heard this in the last uh, uh, panel on Stryka. But what, that, what that's doing is that's putting students at incredible risk um, by being loaded up with debt in order to just attend um, a university or a college. Um, but for faculty, it's also having uh, an impact on faculty through the adjunctification of the university system. And so what we have is a, a pressure, as in all kind of corporate systems, to minimize costs. And since faculty are a cost, they are a variable, variable in, the, in the cost of education, is to put pressure on faculty to make them part-time, to get rid of benefits, um, hire at will, et cetera. And so what you get is this explosion over the last uh, 20 years or so of adjuncts teaching more and more classes. So now, you know, I don't know exactly what the stats are today, and it depends on what kind of institution, but we're talking roughly 50 to 60 percent of all courses being taught are taught by adjuncts who are often making $2,000 a class, so they're piecing together classes, and they're still living below the poverty line working full time, right? and they're teaching your classes. And also that puts pressure on them to not teach as high quality of class as they could if they didn't have such a high teaching load. So give it up to your adjunct professors, by the way, because they're under tremendous pressure and time constraints and they're doing what they can. Uh, but the, structurally they're forced to cut corners and be as efficient as possible um, because of that. So that first point is that that uh, privatization and financialization of education is affecting both faculty and students in different ways, but they have the same source, right? And so I'm saying this to student organizers as that source is the bridge that can be built between both, right? Um, and, and, you know, we could talk, I won't go into all the details, and I talked about this a little bit in the previous session, about the changes in contemporary capitalism that are making um, higher education a source of revenue because other sources of revenue um, are drying up. And so there's tremendous pressure um, and corporate influence on in education as an alternative profit center. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I, I try to always remind people, for example, um, uh, JP uh, uh, Morgan Chase just donated five and a half million dollars to CU Denver to start a center for commodities, which is financial instruments. JP Morgan invented the credit default swap. Um, and that's the kind of commodity that we're talking about. And now CU Denver is structuring graduate, undergraduate certificate programs around the center so that all of this intellectual energy is going into the production of the kind of financial instruments that actually created the crash four years ago. Right? But the university, because of the crash, is desperate for funding. So the bank gives them funding to put students and researchers on the case to create more instruments. Right? This is the system that's created. Right? And that's a system that we're all integrated into. And so as student organizers, that's a point where we can organize. Um, the second point I wanted to make um, is that I, I had this, I'm just gonna generalize from my anecdotal experience, and then it might not apply to you, but as a student organizer, it took me a long time to learn that faculty members mostly don't know what they're doing, politically. They don't know the systems that they inhabit and the power structures that they reproduce. They're just not aware. Um, and those who are 
often don't have the practical political experience of organizing. So even if they're aware and could give you a theoretical account or a descriptive account of the influence of corporations on higher education, adjunctification, uh, the student loan industry as a financialization of education, even if they can give you that, and then you say, we gotta do something about it, they don't know how to do it, right? And so I'm, I'm saying that because it took me years to figure that out. Because <laughs> I kept assuming that I'm a student and I don't know very much, and they're faculty and they know a lot. But what they know is often not what needs to be known in order to change the system. Right? And what that does is that puts the burden on students to organize faculty and train them. Right? And so one of the reasons, one of the ways I met Mike Schwartz is I went and I was looking for faculty who had political experience. And usually it's the case like uh, with Alan and with Mike Schwartz and with myself, those who are politically engaged, and I don't know your history, Chris, I just know Alan personally, that um, we were student activists who then became faculty and then we are, continue to be politically active as faculty members. Point being um, is, is as soon, if you do have that presumption about faculty, as, as soon as you can get rid of that presumption and disabuse yourself of the assumption that faculty know more about politics than you do, the better. Um, was that too harsh? No, that's not harsh. Is that too harsh? No, I don't know. Is that too harsh? <laughs> the great thing about the old student movement is we all got involved in it, right? And the faculty were dead. Exactly. Right. And, at Harvard, you know, Stanley Hoffman was very nice to get up and debate and said, with Dan Ellsberg, who's then a competitor, oh, the Vietnam War is a mistake. And probably of the 250 people in SBS, there were 100 of them who could have out argued Stanley Hoffman about how it was a result of the system of non mistake. Mm -hmm. And we put out pamphlets like Vietnam, no mistake. It was better than anything taught by most faculty in Harvard, period. Yeah, and, and, and the reason I, I want to push that point is that when you're engaging faculty, um, it, it helps to have a strategy of training them politically and telling them what kind of options are available um, to organize, right? And so when I was a student organizer, I would have dinner parties with faculty to bring them together to start training them <laughs> on how to organize, right? And it worked. It worked, right? Um, <laughs> and there are good people, but this is practical experience, right? You just have to know how to organize. Uh, I was taught how to organize. I try to teach people how to organize. People haven't been taught how to organize. It's not something that comes naturally, right? And there is a certain, I think, built-in bias in academia that because we can understand the world theoretically, we think that if we can argue a point, we can change the system. Mm. And that's just simply not true. Critique is absolutely essential, but if it's not combined with organized mm -hmm. practice, it's ineffectual. Right? So that's the end of point two. The last point was, um, and Alan just brought this up, uh, uh, the imaginary part. Um, I mean, there's one thing, I just think it's so exciting that this conference is happening, and I'm so excited to see students organizing. And um, you know, students are organizing on debt, they're organizing around democratizing the institution. And it's natural because the institution is what brought us together that we focus on the institution. But one other piece of wisdom that it took me a long time to gain is that that's a certain kind of education.